welcome to Borderlines. On today's episode, we're going to go beyond uh, the, the bounds of Canadian immigration law to talk about strategic lawsuits against public participation, slap suits. Uh, this discussion will cover anti-slap motions and uh, will include a discussion with Douglas Judson, who has been involved in work with a local LGBTQ organization. Uh, he was working with a drag king who was the subject of defamatory comments. And when he brought this defamation suit, he ended up facing an anti-slap motion uh, that was trying to strike down the lawsuit as a whole on the basis that the comments were in, in the public interest. Uh, the conversation, I think, is quite interesting because it helps us grapple with the court's struggle to distinguish between free expression and hate speech. There are some further uh, tidbits of information in the show notes, and I'd like to ask that if this episode has been of interest to you, that you like the episode or subscribed to our channel uh, so that we can uh, make sure to provide further content like this in future episodes. Thank you. So first, Douglas, thank you uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's Congrats great. on your recent win in the uh, Ontario Court of Justice. Thank you. It's uh, you know a, a team effort, and I, I, you know, I'm here for Judson Howie LLP, but I also want to recognize our co-counsel McCarthy Tatro in Toronto. They were a big part of this uh, of this uh, litigation. Yeah, and it's a defamation lawsuit. Although I think the defamation proceedings are still ongoing, and what you were successful in was defeating a slap motion. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's a fair summation. So our clients are a small town LGBT pride organization in Dryden, Ontario, which is a town of about 8,000 people, about four hours northwest of Thunder Bay, uh, as well as the chair of that organization who also performs as a drag king. Um, and they were smeared on a prominent or these well-trafficked Facebook page in our region uh, as groomers. And with our assistance, they've brought an action in defamation against the publisher of those comments. And uh, subsequent to that, he brought an anti-slap motion seeking the dismissal of the action against him. Do you want to just pause to say what a, a groomer is? Well, I, I, the decision actually um, speaks to what yeah. to what it is, which has been very helpful for us because I think that this is a weasel word that a lot of people have been using in dark corners on the internet. Um, but the, the terminology has very long, deep roots in anti-LGBT rhetoric. Um, it essentially is suggesting or or outright stating uh, that members of the queer community or you know drag performers, others, uh, trans folks. Um, are seeking to recruit people into um, LGBTQ sexual identities or are seeking to um, even cause uh, to to abuse or or or, in, or cause you know sexual violence to come to young people. Um, the, the, this dates back to like the 1970s Anita Bryant Save the Children, sort of all of those tropes and slurs um, that have been weaponized against LGBT people to suggest that they are a danger freight to young people or that their presence in society is uh, is is improper or 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 disgusting or or something of that nature. So groomer is a is a term that is intended to point to and that. Implicit in that is it like if you're calling someone a groomer, are you also implying that they're a pedophile? Yes, absolutely. That's uh, yeah, core to the to the suggestion. And you see that in the commentary on the Facebook post related to our litigation. Yeah, this is one of those topics that uh, there's a lawyer uh, locally, Adrian Smith, who talks quite a bit about the sort of six myths of the LGBTQ community, uh, one of them being the kind of infectious nature of of gender dysphoria, even that being in itself um, uh, a myth. And so um, the other thing I would I would love for you to slow down around is what does slap mean and what does anti-slap mean? Yeah. Well, I think we'll get yeah. like, why don't we even go even before that? So defamation, which I think mm -hmm. is you don't get to slap without there being an initial defamation lawsuit. So what is yeah. defamation? 
lots to unpack in this area of yeah. law. So uh, defamation, generally um, expression that is broadcast or publicized, that is harmful to your reputation as the as the person who is the subject of that expression. Um, people are often familiar with the words libel and slander. Uh, the most common form of defamation is libel, which has to do with published or broadcast expression. Uh, so such as in a newspaper would be a very traditional form of a defamatory comment. Um, but increasingly today, we're seeing this uh, in, on social media, which um, gives everyone a platform uh, to make to make comments. Slander, uh, a less common form of defamation, but typically more related to um, um, less permanent forms of definition, almost like gossip. Uh, so um, that, that's kind of how I describe them when people come to see me in my office. But so defamation, this is a this proceeding we're talking about is a libel action against a publisher on Facebook. And so a slap suit has always got its roots in defamation. Is there a different type of a slap suit that could occur? That is a really great question. Uh, so SLAP, as an acronym for those unfamiliar, stands for Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation. Um, Anti-SLAP laws are intended to prevent slaps, to prevent people, um, plaintiffs, from bringing um, claims against people that are intended simply to shut them down or prevent them from expressing themselves on matters of public or community interest. So um, I think a classic example of a slap would be a big multinational company um, trying to threaten or bully a grassroots organization that's being publicly critical of its environmental record. Uh, and that's typically a hallmark of slap we see is, is a power imbalance between the parties like that. But that's not the only type. Um, so in answer to your question, though, um, slaps typically find their roots in defamation because the action is typically concerned with expression, with things people have published or have said. Um, but there are other types of proceedings that could also be slaps. Um, those are less common. And so in general, the uh, the legal test under the anti-slap laws that we have in Canada uh, has developed through defamation. And so what is the procedure in slap? That simplifies it, because my understanding is that it's designed that if somebody is sued for defamation, they can use a simplified process to have the lawsuit dismissed seems like these cases now, like maybe you can comment, take on a life of their own. Like in your decision, it seemed like the justice was also going into all the tests for defamation and there almost had to be like, it almost seemed like a mini defamation hearing yeah. and the proceedings, you know, there was a Supreme Court decision last year. So how much simpler is it than just a defamation lawsuit? You've hit the nail on the head, I think, of the controversy around anti-slap is that um, I, I think if you go back to some of the earliest appellate authorities we have on it, um, the, the comments from the bench are that this is supposed to be sort of a cursory process. It's not supposed to be a trial in a box. It's supposed to be, you know, this is um, a way for us to like take a, take the temperature of an action, see if it is, uh, you know, intending to prevent people from engaging on a matter of public interest and then decide whether to dismiss the action. Now, uh, I, I think in the spirit of that, um, the action still has can go forward to trial, even if the anti-slap isn't successful. So, you know, a defendant do doesn't just get this kick at the can. They can still, they may still have defenses they advance at the trial. Um, the reality is, though, that these have turned into gargantuan summary judgment motions in, in I think, in, in most situations. And I think the, the reason for that is that the test is multifaceted. There are several stages. Um, and the consequences of being unsuccessful as a plaintiff are very severe. Um, and uh, I, I, I believe the legislation is the same in Ontario and BC, being the only two provinces with anti-slap law right now. Um, but in Ontario, the plaintiff who loses the anti-slap motion is on the hook for full costs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a fairly you know, significant concern at the front end of, of, of a piece of litigation. Uh, and so people often want to put their best foot forward in the way they would in summary judgment, which is, uh, you know, to, to bring everything you got to the anti-slap hearing. And, you know, I, I can tell you the the ones I've been involved with have massive motion records or significant amounts of material. Uh, in our case, there was expert evidence. Um, and it's like how many pages are we talking? 
hundreds uh Hundred. pretty easily yeah. Yeah. So is there discovery and witnesses or there could be cross-examination on affidavits as as in any other uh any other action um but uh you know, we we certainly didn't have that in, in in our motion but it's it's available to a party okay so if the whole objective here is that you've got sort of a david and goliath kind of a battle going on and the objective of anti-slap is to prevent someone who was trying to exercise free speech in the public interest from being buried in costly litigation then the question is whether or not it's actually serving that purpose because it sounds to me like this is not going to be a summary process this is not going to be an easy thing that's going to vitiate the need for um, a very involved legal process it, it really i think causes the it puts a lot of burden on a plaintiff um to have marshaled enough material to sort of substantiate at, at least at a high level what their what their claim is um that it is truly a, a defamation claim that it is not an attempt to shut someone down who's communicating on a matter of public interest and uh, that can often be challenging at the early stages of litigation because remember an anti-slap motion is brought generally right after the statement of claim. There's no defense yet. So you don't even know how the other party might respond to the actual allegations. And we're dealing with online commentary and social media. Maybe the plaintiff hasn't fully discovered who the defendants are, how the how the expressions came to be, um, where they were made, and who's, who's behind the accounts doing that. So it does take, I think, a significant preparation to, uh, in in bringing an action like this to know okay are we going do we have our ducks lined up in case we have to defend an anti-slap motion you know depending on what the expressions uh pertains to and what is the test in a slap motion so it is a three-stage test um and the motion can fail at any stage but the the first question is a threshold question of whether the expression that is at, at issue is a matter of public interest Again, here, slaps do not need to be housed in defamation, but the test relates to expression, so that's how it's developed. Um, if the expression is found to um, not relate to a matter of public interest, the motion fails right at the first stage. Uh, you will see in our decision that that is exactly what happened. Uh, the, the motion was dismissed because it was determined that the expression on Facebook did not relate to a matter of public interest. If the... If, if the a uh, motion is, is succeeds in overcoming that threshold. The next uh, stages look at um, a merits-based hurdle, sort of assessing the viability of the claim, whether there's valid defenses the defendant would have. And then subsequent to that, a public interest balancing of the public interest in uh, allowing the expression to continue versus allowing the plaintiff to defend their reputation. And there's some various contextual factors that have to be weighed there. So, there's a lot that goes into that that analysis, and you tend to see these very long decisions from anti-slap as a result. And so if you get to the merits-based hurdle and the moving party establishes that the published, publish, public interest balancing is not in their favor, um, that ultimately the slap motion will be successful and the the action will not get to move forward. Is that right? Yes. If the motion is defeated, the action gets to go forward. So if the if the court determines that there is not significant public interest in the expression at issue um, to to dismiss the dismiss the action, then the the legal proceeding will continue on track to discovery and trial and the other things that that come next in the in the usual process. So in that situation, the the David, in my analogy, actually has to, in a hurry, satisfy the court that there is a meritorious basis for their claim, failing which the entire um, the entire case gets thrown out. Yeah, so you'll want to satisfy the court if you are the if you are the uh, the plaintiff, the or the sorry the 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 the, the party trying to say there's there that there is. Um, not a public interest expression that's being shut down. I'm trying to simplify the language here. If you're yeah. trying to say that, you want to be able to show the court that you've got you know enough here to make out the elements of defamation, that right. there was an expression made, that it was public, that it was about the, the, the plaintiff. Uh, and you also want to show that 
the defendant doesn't seem to have other def defenses available to them, defamation defenses being things like fair comment and qualified privilege and uh, right. responsible communication on matters of public interest. I so, keep getting this switched around because I am accustomed to seeing these cases with the parties in different roles. I'll be I'll be frank, you know, and I think that um, before we connected, I think you mentioned that this is something that you hear frequently. Um, I'm seeing these cases often in situations where it's like groups of sexual assault survivors who are who are actually the subject to these slap motions. And so um, I think that your case is a little bit um, unique um, in terms of what we're dealing with. But I, th I think yeah. you've explained the mechanics of it. Well, I think there was a Supreme Court decision last year where it was almost the inverse, where there was a politician yes. suing someone for defamation for what they had said. Um, I don't remember the details, maybe. Yeah, that, that's a BC anti-slap decision, uh, Newfield and Hansman. Um, and you know, very interestingly, so our our case, the plaintiff is representing the LGBT interest. The you know they're saying that you've smeared us as pedophiles on the internet. Um, that was defamatory, and the def the defendant brought this anti-slap motion saying, no, my expression related to a matter of public interest. In that decision from the Supreme Court, it's almost the reverse. Um, because in that situation, it was a school board trustee, uh, Neufeld, who had sued uh, this educator, Hansman, who had made public comments suggesting that Neufeld's uh, commentary was bigoted um, towards uh, the trans and gender diverse community. Um, and the court determined in that decision uh, that uh, the that Newfeld's action against Hansen was a slap, and that uh, it, it specifically made comments, very interesting comments about the need to to create a protected space for counter speech um, that uh, that protects and sort of asserts itself in the defense of marginalized groups in society. So um, taking these together, I actually think we have sort of an interesting direction that the law of defamation and slap is going because it seems to be recognizing. The, the social context in which that expression is taking place. Before getting into that, uh, the broader discussion of where it's going, you mentioned that fair comment defense to defamation. How similar is the defense of fair comment to public interest in SLAP? Well, fair comment, you know, generally, you know, has to be grounded in some sort of factual basis, right? There has to be some nugget there that you, you're you you're presenting a reasonable point of view about. Um, when we do the anti-slap analysis, uh, the responding party on that motion is going to want to show that the moving party, the defendant, doesn't have any valid defenses. So they're going to want to establish that there is no reasonable basis to suggest that fair comment applies. Um, in a case like ours, um, there was uh, there was the, the, the judge made findings that fair comment did not appear to be available, that it appeared that there were some elements of malice, which which uh, under which uh, vitiates fair comment as a defense. Uh, and so that's kind of how they fit together. They're not they're not the same type of legal concept in this analysis, but one is part of the other as a process. But am I right that that actually is that the part of the second component of the test is that right or is that still part of the whether or not this is a matter of public interest it's part of the second piece the merits based hurdle you're looking to whether the claim has merit does it actually seem to have the pieces that make defamation and whether the defendant has a valid defense okay so let's let's then step back for a second and start with the matter of public interest because i think you said that that is actually where the case was successful on the mm -hmm matter of public interest components. So um, first of all, how did the court, what did they have to say about whether or not this was a matter of public interest? Basically, right out of the gate, um, the judge in our decision found that the expression did not meet the public um, interest threshold. Um, now, the the defendant had tried to suggest uh, that the post in question had referred to a CBC News article that was about drag events our clients uh, were organizing. And he had tried to say that his comments were actually um, sort of media criticism, that he was um, expressing himself about, you know, his 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 views about how the CBC reports on stories like this. Um, 
And uh, that was rejected. Uh, the court actually found that his comments went well beyond that um, by, and I'll quote it here, perpetuating hurtful myths and stereotypes about vulnerable members in society. Um, and, and further that the defendant's argument that he was accusing the CBC of grooming had no merit based on a plain reading of the post. So I, I think from that, we can take that the court found that you know, the suggestion that um, these the perpetuating myths about a, about a vulnerable, identifiable group like this is not going to attract that public interest protection. Yeah, I like how um, the justice says that that um, that the purpose of anti slap is to prevent the silencing of persons who are speaking in matters that have significance beyond themselves, that that's what public interest is, is that um, it sort of set up a nice thing about like, what is the difference between ex freedom of expression kind of in the, in the classic American sense, you know, just stating what you believe versus what is public interest and that one has to be more than your own personal opinion mm -hmm. but that is actually something that is in the public interest and something the community i think would have an actual benefit to knowing or to knowing ideas about right like because we for example there are all sorts of things out there that i think we're all interested in knowing like celebrity gossip and and matters like that that i don't know actually advance a community interest in any real meaningful way other than that you know we might be curious about those things well and there's also the issue of like okay if the person wants to challenge cbc funding fair enough but the third party who's the uh the plaintiff here was called a pedophile and a groomer like it's you know i could see like even if the goal is media criticism and i think the judge alludes to this or directly states it it's like sure you were you know even if that was your goal you completely like you just called you know the the drag king the plaintiff a pedophile yeah it doesn't uh, in the process like yeah yes yeah and, and and she's she's referred to in her decision um case law that is clear that you can't simply you know include defamatory language within like a broader, you know, public interest conversation and expect that to attract protection. Like it doesn't get whitewashed that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that is also very helpful language because a lot of this type of expression in particular is arising in public discussion or in adjacent to public discussion about things like, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum, and drag story time events at public libraries, and other things that um, naturally do have some nexus with a public institution or a public service offering or something like that. This to me is where I can see the value of anti-slap, where it's sort of trying to, to um, you know, the, the court actually at paragraph 35 talks about the the sort of balancing of public of of freedom of expression against um against public interest you know that not all speech is protected um and i see that as being a very valuable proposition it's sort of um it's like you know we don't have that American proposition that like you can just say what you want um, just because you have the right to speak that that freedom mm -hmm. is not unlimited and I, I like that it's I get much more complex around the part two of the test you know yeah. that um, that I think it, it does get much more bogged down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I think absolutely is that the the and it kind of sort of goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago is this idea that um the anti-slap uh, is almost like a check-in for this action to see like is this uh you know at a glance is it is it unfairly trying to restrict communication on a matter of public interest you know animated by all those factors you've just described the fact that we don't have an unbridled freedom of speech in canada um and that there are reputational factors that are protected and i i think that that is um, you know, one of one of the complexities here is that, you know, we read this decision and without really knowledge of the nuance of anti-slap, it looks like, oh, geez, this looks like when this matter goes forward to trial or whoever it's disposed of in the future that, you know, these plaintiffs are going to be successful. And, you know, certainly, I think they're going to be successful because <laughs> I'm their lawyer. But, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that this is not a decision on the merits. It's sort of looking like from like 50,000 foot view of like, 
does it seem like all the elements to an actual legitimate case are here? And does mm -hmm. it seem like, does it look like it's trying to shut down people from talking about something that matters to the community? And so it, you know, it may read to some people like it's a merits decision, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. I think it does start to bend my brain though, when you get into part two, I don't know if that's where you were headed, Steve. No, I was going to uh, go in a completely different direction. So why don't you finish on part two? Yeah, I mean, when it when it when you start getting into the merits based assessment, um, it really does to me, I, I understand that it's not meant to get into the merits of the case, but it really does, especially when you're looking at the cases more like the Newfeld decision, it does start to feel like a summary judgment to me. And again, yeah. the, the majority of the cases that I have been reading involve cases where the defamation, the alleged defamation relates to allegations of sexual assault or something like that, where the, um, the, the person who is um, alleging that the speech is, the expression is, should be protected or that it shouldn't be um, pro prohibited, um, are in the position of having a very difficult time um, establishing at that summary stage that there is merit to the claim and that um, that they should not be buried in costs of trying to prove that the allegation is meritorious and that um, you know that the that the anti-slap litigation can be absolutely prohibitive for them. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly one of the sensitivities here. Like in a case like this one, um, where we can see what the expression is because it's written in black and white on the internet, it's not a case that relates to sort of um, you know someone's experience in a moment in interacting with somebody else or something that's more requires findings of fact, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that it's one curiosity I have about the whole thing is in a decision like this one what's the next step? Does this really need to go to trial? Like when we have, it seems, we have all the admissions and everything related to the basic facts of publication. We can see what the publication is. It appears there's a finding on how, what it was meant to mean. Um, should we, are we not sort of doing a do-over as a summary judgment motion now? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's often the case with like a published libel. Um, you know, in these other situations like you're describing that I think are a bit more, you um, that have more material facts in dispute necessarily. Um, it, it is, I think, I think a question mark sometimes about does it, what is the threshold for um, that merits-based assessment? For sure. When, you know, you can't just read the post on the internet and see what totally. it says. And I mean, you you mentioned the Newfeld decision. I just did a brief review. I saw Rooney and Galloway. I saw um, Deeb and Zabia and I saw Smith and Nagy. And some of these have decisions that are, 20 pages, 30 pages long with indices, you know, and they ultimately say that they all get very, very focused on the no valid defense part. And you can see in those decisions that the person who made the expression was not able to overcome or that the no valid defense part is where the motion ended up being successful and the, um, uh, so, so again, it 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 did it didn't look like that was going to be a walk in the park, and I'm sure that those those litigation costs were gi gigantic. Yeah, and you know the I think the other thing that's weird about it is that in the current litigation climate we have, at least in civil litigation, we our courts are struggling with volume and like finding time for parties, and so when we have now this almost de facto step that so many um, defendants are pursuing through when they're faced with a libel action or um, it and these are not you know again not easy motions they take up a lot of time like ours is a full day hearing um, that is you know not necessarily economical for the court um, and then we're sort of if it moves forward we have sort of other steps that do appear to replicate some parts of it right like you've mentioned you know in the, in the types of cases you're describing uh, presumably people are putting in affidavit evidence to, you know, support what's happened and setting out um, their, you know, their, their evidence in, in writing. They're then being cross-examined on that. Let's suppose that the action continues. There's then discovery on much of the same material, right? So in an economics of litigation analysis, I do wonder, like, are we still finding our way in the dark a little bit about what the best process is and whether this 
Um, we're, we're, we are stuck with the statutory framing of this, but mm -hmm. you know, is this really the best model to do this? Yeah, and I, I still wonder, um, I, um, it's not that I wonder, I, I, I still think that at the root of this, is there still an, a general tension around what our values are with respect to freedom of expression and defamation, hate speech, all of that sort of thing. I mean, to me, when it comes to the case that you're presenting, um, it's a pretty easy, I mean, for me personally, not that anybody cares, it's a pretty easy yeah. one, like, <laughs> no, there's no entitlement to make these kinds of expressions, you know? But when it comes to something where it's like a me too kind of a campaign, I have a really hard time saying that, yes, that person who feels defamed like that that expression about like hey this person did this thing to me that they shouldn't be entitled to make those comments and that the person that feels defamed by that shouldn't just have to you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. make their own defense you know like i'm sorry uh you find it defamatory but i don't know i don't feel that that speech should be prohibited mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. let's let's Kind of, yeah, I'm going to use that to segue into one of my questions, which was when I, I took defamation law in law school, and I remember going in with a staunch, you know, screw defamation, freedom of speech. And then as with many things in law school, you read your first case, you see your first pat fact pattern, and you go, okay, um, there's definitely another side to this. So what is in defamation, like what, how is the amount that the lawsuit is for calculated? Like, what are the damages in this case or do you even have to seek damages and in this case you know if you could describe the harm that being called a pedophile slash groomer is like what is the harm to this person you know in, in an era where some people may say sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me right like what's the harm in being yeah. called yeah, no, I, I think that that is um these are good questions and in every defamation action I think there is um, I, I hazard to say judges cover your ears so there's more of like a, you know an art than a science to maybe figuring out what the number is and I think that that is is one of those issues where determining what an amount is you know is you look to the authorities and see where your case sort of falls and in what's happened um I, I think that uh we have a pretty broad range like I was just looking earlier today to refresh my memory but there's a, an Ontario decision uh, Paramount Fine Foods in Johnston uh, that resulted in a two and a half million dollar uh, award in defamation, which is very significant by, I, I think, Canadian court standards. Um, I, I, I think that your heads of, of damage that you're probably looking at to bake into that amount are going to be aggravated. You're going to be looking at like, you know, was there actual malice or conduct related to the um, the impugned expression that is sort of you know, vile, something that offends their, our sense of decency, um, something that is hateful. Uh, I think that's, that's a piece of it. Uh, you have punitive damages. Is there, you know, a manner of the expression we just sort of want to denounce, um, you know, as, you know, as a society, there's something like just completely improper about it. And then I think the final thing, you're turning to special damages. Are there specific um, out-of-pocket costs that the plaintiff has taken on or opportunities they didn't get because of the um, the expression at issue, so yeah. you know, so maybe like the the do person doesn't have to always like unlike say in a car accident for general damages of like lost income opportunity or the cost of fixing the you know treatment and everything, it's not necessary for her to show, hey, I lost this contract to be eligible for any compensation. It's the community like. You know, there's now a, a, an X number of people who, like, because of this statement, think I'm a pedophile. Yeah, I, I think that that's it. Is that you know, the, I, I'm not going to say the numbers are divined from thin air, but I think that you know, you're looking at there's sort of deemed damages when people mm -hmm. make expression that says certain things. Obviously, there's different types of defamatory comments people can make. Uh, the court has uh, re recognized certain types of false allegations as being more damaging than others. So, for example, um, smearing someone as a pedophile or a terrorist or something like that, I think would be would be right up there. Uh, others, perhaps not not so much. Um, I think also, you, you know, the court's going to look at where was the defamatory comment made? How long was it up there? Was there an attempt to remove it after they were notified? Did they dig in and republish it? There's all these factors that are going to sort of feed into what that analysis is.
-hmm. is the and this is going to like probably come across as an ignorant comment but like from what you know is the in this i've seen videos in the states of like groups showing up to some of these drag events where you know it seems like there's the potential for violence and maybe in some cases is violence is that a thing in canada as well where people are showing up to events I think so. Probably not as 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 commonly as we're seeing south of the border, but um, I, as it so happens, I'm in Puerto Vallarta right now, and I went to a drag event last night. And uh, one of the things we talked about, one of the performers, with that this is becoming you know a real concern in in the, for the work that they're doing, not just in you know performance clubs like we were at, but you know when they're going out to the community and doing public facing things, that it's a it's a real concern and having to sort of proactively think about you know their security and you know what measures are in place to you know not to avoid disruption at a better minimum of, of yeah. what you're trying to do so it, it is a real um it, it is a real concern that that i think is becoming more prominent i think that the type of expression that's at issue in our litigation has been uh normalized by some uh mainstream political actors which is concerning i, I can tell you that in making the argument that the his expression was on a matter of public interest, the death the defendant in our proceeding actually included affidavit evidence um, relating to comments that were made by Pierre Polyev and Maxime Bernier to justify some of what he had said. So I, I mean, people are looking at the winks and nudges from political leadership, and in sort of demonstrating the the defamatory nature of the comments, the reputational harm and the risk to our clients. One of the things that we put in expert evidence on was that there is now um, evidence out there in, that links um, political action to online hate to offline violence. And yeah. so this type of commentary um, is it gives rise to that risk. And um, another question that uh, when I told people we were doing this episode that I got, is there a requirement in defamation that like, you know, you or your client reach out to the person and say like, either delete the post, apologize, make a new post? Um, is there like a mitigation in defamation? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know the the ins and outs of the governing legislation in BC. Uh, in Ontario, there's a requirement to serve notice of libel when, when a published comment is alleged to be defamatory. And, you know, typically when I'm acting for someone, uh, and I think most lawyers would do this, they, it sort of starts with a libel notice that it has a legal demand that you remove the, and often that sort of opens the door to perhaps resolution of these, of, of these things. So not every form of defamation is necessarily grounded in, you know, complete malice or, you know, hate speech. Um, sometimes there is, you know, space there to, to reach resolution without going to court. So um, I, I think that that's kind of how it happens is because of the notice requirement, there can be discussion around that. Interesting. And then I think uh, my last question, and it's, it's, um, pertains to like, you know, Deanna had talked about the, uh, the Me Too movement and how the public interest test can be challenging in different contexts. I was trying to think like, you know, uh, from a left wing, right wing, like perspective of, okay, what's the group on the other side that, not the other side, but like, what's another group that, um, you know, can get accused of being pedophiles in discourse and the one that came to mind is priests um certainly at comedy clubs priests are you know it's it's regular joke now it seems that in a lot of stand-up i'm not i don't know if you're aware like of any defamation cases involving that but do you see the public interest test as being well, one I that kind that... of protects the historically marginalized group or one that's also like yeah. looking at this language and the tone of debate and whether there's a public interest in this well we have to go back to sort of you know the fundamentals of defamation like the expression has to be about you know a person or like a you know a legal person like a, whether that's a corporation or um or an individual or something like that um and so i, I don't know that making general comments you know uh, would attract a, a claim or give rise to a cause of action like that mm. um certainly 
there, you know, we can, once you get past that, there's questions about, well, you know, is there any factual basis to make the comment? Is there, is there a fair comment? But I, I think, you know, off the cuff, the expression we're talking about in this litigation is that this person posted actual photos and names of people with commentary that strongly implied or stated that these people are groomers, these people are pedophiles. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it wasn't just a general comment that like, I do not like drag. I think the drag performance is not appropriate for children. I think the drag performance is, you know, trying to twist children into homosexuality or something like that. That and was with no I, historical or factual evidence no, to back it. No, and, and no, no historical basis to say that. But I, I don't think it would be defamatory if there's no actual, you know, person that you're pinning that to. That you're saying these people are are doing these nefarious things. Interesting. That's a good point. Yeah, no, it's a lot to, uh, it's a lot to chew on like mm -hmm. the, that, that boundaries and everything. I think, yeah, like in this, um, without prejudging your case, like actually your case was really interesting because a, it, it was finally a case that made me get how the slap works and like the judge laid it all out and B it does involve that, um, kind of an act like it's just it's an active issue in terms of the language on the internet like my friend is a teacher uh on the island vancouver island and she was saying that you know in the context of british columbia i don't know if this is the same uh debate out in ontario about the introduction of soji um guidelines in schools that she has parents you know contacting the school and being like well you're a bunch of you know groomers um, and you talked about the normalization of this language. Like it does seem just something that, you know, I, I haven't followed, like as someone who hadn't followed, I guess the simmering issues where like the language all of a sudden just seemed to come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. um, and people being, you know, harmed by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the people who have pushed this idea that there is some sort of, you know, broad-based libel to be applied to uh, the queer community, always find a new sort of thing to pick at, right? Like it's it was uh, trans people in sports, it was drag performers in public libraries and schools. Um, it's always sort of a new version of that. And every time we, you know, we think we've overcome it, there's sort of a new way that they invigorate this um, hateful rhetoric. And that is, um, I, I well, frankly, it's discouraging for people who are engaged in this kind of advocacy, I can say that. Um, but uh, I, I hope that this type of decision and this litigation, wherever it ends up, does send a message that, you know, there are consequences that attach to irresponsible expression uh, of this nature. And I, I think that, um, you know, we recognize that there was a possibility of facing an anti-slap challenge in this litigation at the outset. And that was something that we made sure that we were prepared for because the last thing we wanted was a court decision to come out that said that, hey, it's a matter of public interest to go out and say that drag performers are members of the queer community or groomers. Mm -hmm. Like that would be an absolute nightmare scenario. And so it was critical to us to be successful on the first stage of the test. For sure. I mean, to me, this is, um, I think it's sort of, uh, got dragged into this sort of ambit of, of anti-slap litigation. And I say that um, to me, it's really just, it's very successful hate speech litigation from my perspective. And I find that like kudos because I think that um, to me, it's really, um, it's really clear. It's very clean, you know, <laughs> it's very like, it's very, um, I don't know. I, I just find it very clear. I found it was, I, I, I like a nice structured decision. It's very structured. Totally. Um, it's also like not equivocal, you know, it's very like, no, you know, not all. I decided this, but even if I didn't decide this, I would throw this out for all these other reasons. <laughs> so yeah, for was... sure. And I feel like, you know, litigation that you see like constitutional litigation around expression, it's never had that clarity. Whereas this is just like, uh, uh this is not privilege. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't come within the, the constitutional framework, but I think if anti-slap litigation could have this, yay, like that's, that's, that's big. I think yeah. once you get into, well, no, this is in the public interest, which is what's happening with the Me Too type expressions. It is in the public interest. And then you get bogged down with the, okay, well, is it 
is there the defense of da da da? Then I think we've got a bit much bigger problem, and I think that's the subject of a separate podcast, perhaps in yeah. a whole like other area of um, yeah. of conversation and difficulty. But I think this, if this is a new pathway for people to challenge, like truly. Um, hateful speech um, I think you've really carved out something exceptional thank you very much and uh, I appreciate that and uh, I want to give credit here um, Egal Canada intervened on this motion um, Daniel Gerlando and his team at Board and Ladder Gervais were a big part of this appreciate um, all of that advocacy um, and also our co-counsel McCarthy Tatro um, brought a lot to this file and uh, we we wouldn't be in the shape we're in today with, without that contribution um, I, I think that this is probably an area of law, like it's still relatively new. I think 2017 is the first anti-slap law that was, I, I think BC had one that didn't have one, now has one again or something. But um, in Ontario, at least it was 2017 or so. And I think that, you know, a few years into this, it'll probably be a good topic for like a law reform investigation. Like, mm. you know, okay, we've got all this case law now. Does this need to have carve outs? Like, you know, are there cases like those Me Too ones you're describing that maybe aren't appropriate for anti slap? Um, yeah. Do we need to have different off ramps de depending on the action? And should it apply to different types of proceedings? Like, I have, um, I've, I do a lot of work in municipal law right now, and I see a lot of integrity code of conduct complaints made against municipal office holders for things they've said that people don't like. And I wonder sometimes, should that attract some type of protection? Uh, similarly with human rights proceedings, I think that sometimes, you know, those veer into areas where perhaps the person is trying to convey an, an idea on a matter of public interest, maybe have not has not done so well, but there's, mm -hmm. you know, should be a way to vindicate what they have, what they've tried to accomplish. So I, I think that there's part of the iterative processes of this is that maybe, you know, when we get 10 years in, there will be an effort to revisit this and look at whether it needs to be sharpened. Well, we'll keep an eye out for sure. And uh, at any point uh, you want to come back and tell us where things are at, uh, we would welcome hearing back from you again. Well, oh, the, definitely. The, the reward for pie is more pie. And I can tell yep. you more cases like <laughs> 100%. come to us. So, uh, so yeah, we've, uh, we're, we're, and we're happy to, to assist clients that are in this situation. So yeah. you know, we expect that we'll have a few more um proceedings related to this one well, we are in that pie eating contest with you too so uh... <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs>